In fifth generation form, Land Rover's Discovery continues to offer the toughest, the most practical and the most capable choice in the large SUV sector. Structurally, this time round, much has been borrowed from larger Range Rover models, along with fresh engine options and more sophisticated media connectivity. The Discovery, though, continues to have its own authentic appeal. In many ways, it's the ultimate expression of the Land Rover brand. This is the Land Rover Discovery, though probably not as you know it. In fifth generation form, this car has been reimagined and revitalized by the Solihull brand to better compete with its less capable large segment SUV rivals. In short, there's a lot to discover. Now, without the Discovery model line, it's doubtful whether the Land Rover brand would even exist today. Launched back in 1989, the original version merely bolted more spacious bodywork onto an aging Range Rover chassis. But the sales of this and the subsequent updated Discovery 2 design managed to generate were considerable. I mean, enough to save the company and finance development of a properly sophisticated Discovery model, uh, the third generation car that was launched in 2004. Now, thanks to its double chassis and its air-suspended integrated body frame technology, this contender was able to match decent tarmac driving dynamics to Land Rover's legendary off-road prowess, and customers loved it. So much so that the brand kept the same basic design for the Discovery 4 model of 2009, which added in a smarter cabin and more effective engine wear. When the time came to create the fifth generation version of this SUV though, it was clear that a fresh direction would be needed. As you can see, the uh, familiar boxy shape has given way to a sleeker silhouette and that borrows much from the smaller Discovery Sport model. And what lies beneath this curvier panelwork is even more significant. That old heavy duty body on frame architecture of the previous designs has been replaced by the more car like aluminium monocoque used by modern era large Range Rovers. If in this Mark V model you were to mate that with the entry level SD4 twin turbo four cylinder diesel engine uh, that's been introduced to widen the appeal of lower order discoveries, you'd get yourself a car that's nearly half a ton lighter than uh, the most comparable version of its direct predecessor. So, progress indeed. And there's uh, plenty else that demonstrates that. Some of it's controversial, like the decision to dispense with the old split rear tailgate. And some of it is merely sensible, like the introduction of new era media connectivity and camera driven safety tech. Ultimately, the object of it all, says Land Rover, is to create a large luxury seven seat SUV that can compete more credibly with ultra modern feeling rivals like Audi's Q7 and Volvo's XC90 and attract fresh buyers to the brand. All without upsetting the muddy boot wearing upper middle class folk who've done so much to establish a Discovery model line. That is asking a lot, but if this car can deliver on its promises, it'll achieve its maker's stated objective to have produced nothing less than the ultimate family SUV. One of the main concerns that we had in approaching this fifth generation Discovery was that it would drive too much like the model it now shares most of its engineering with, the Range Rover Sport, but there wouldn't be much point in simply duplicating the driving dynamics of that car and Land Rover hasn't, uh, contending itself with merely bringing the whole experience a little closer to what buyers used to rival large European SUVs will expect. Folk like that will still have to get used to a few differences though. Uh, the cabin, for example, quite intentionally doesn't deliver the kind of cockpit-like design that you get in a more car-like SUV with all the controls angled towards you. Here, the position is more like it would be in a fully-fledged top Range Rover, a place of command, uh, a place to do business with the elements, whether they be the snake-infested swamps of the rainy season in the Serengeti or the snarled-up traffic of a wet, windy morning on the school run. You'll want to know about the changes this time around, and they really are fundamental, thanks to a completely fresh aluminium monocoque chassis that's been borrowed from the brand's two largest Range Rover models. 
This has made it possible to offer the option of a smaller four-cylinder two-litre diesel engine this time around. And thus equipped, an entry-level variant in this Mark V Discovery range is a massive 480 kilos lighter than the base derivative in the previous model lineup. Now, despite that, this SUV does remain a significantly heavy thing, with most variants weighing in at well over the 2.2 tonne mark, particularly those that are fitted with the three-litre TD6 six-cylinder diesel that most will want. And that's the one that we're trying here. What will be new to you if you're a Discovery regular is the way that this SUV can now handle its prodigious bulk. Where the old model wallowed through corners if you attempted to take them with any sort of speed, this car feels just much more at ease with its size and shape. Yes, there is still lots of body roll through faster curves, but uh, you always feel that the Disco is in complete control of it. Is it just like the top plurocratic Range Rover model? Well, yes, exactly like that. The Range Rover Sport shows that this setup could be even better. Uh, that car uses a package of so-called dynamic technology features that would further develop this chassis's surprisingly able levels of tarmac prowess. Things like uh, variable damping, active lean control, torque vectoring, and an active rear locking differential. None of this is available on a Discovery, and you wouldn't want it if it was. Here, driving enjoyment is delivered through lowering the heartbeat rather than raising it. All manner of asphalt dispatched with a sense of imperious superiority that we previously thought only a fully-fledged Range Rover could deliver. There's standard air suspension as there was in the old model, but it now seems properly engaged with the business of directing your discovery where you point it, working with the extra stiffness of the more rigid body to allow corners to be taken far more quickly than they ever could be before. A lighter rival Audi Q7 or Volvo XC90 SUV would be a little faster through any given set of turns, no question, but it wouldn't be any more stable or any more enjoyable either. The vastly improved steering rack, that's another thing that's been borrowed from the Range Rover Sport, also helps immeasurably here, transforming the response you get at the helm from being slow, heavy and spongy as it was on the Discovery 4 to the light, direct and responsive demeanour now in evidence. Earlier, we mentioned the diesel engines on offer. Now, in terms of output, they seem pretty competitive with class alternatives. Uh, the four-cylinder SD4 unit developing 240 bhp and this V6 TD6 putting out 258 bhp. Look at the performance stats, though, and you might wonder about that. Now, where the volume version of an Audi Q7, the 3-litre TDI 272 PS model, needs little more than six seconds to hit 62 miles an hour from rest, this Discovery TD6 needs nearly eight and it has an 130 miles an hour top speed that's fully 15 miles an hour slower than that Ingolstadt rival. Look at the mid-range acceleration figures and it's a similar story, but to focus on stats of this sort is to miss the point. In real world motoring, you simply wouldn't want a car of this kind to be any quicker than this Discovery is. Its eight-speed ZF Auto gearbox ushers you along with a swift, unhurried sense of determined purpose. Anyway, it's perfectly clear that in tuning these engines, the Solihull engineers have taken more account of the likely needs of potential buyers than is the case with rival brand models. Uh, take towing capacity, for example. Uh, the four-cylinder SD4 diesel puts out 500 newton meters of torque, and you get 600 newton meters of it in this six-cylinder TD6 model. You even get 450 newton meters of torque in the sole petrol version on offer, the three-liter SI6 variant, which uses a 340 PS supercharged petrol V6 that's borrowed from the Jaguar F-Type sports car. That's enough in all three cases to facilitate a three and a half tonne brake towing capacity. A rival Audi Q7 3 litre TDI can only tow 2.8 tonnes and a Volvo XC90 just 2.4 tonnes. That gives you some perspective on the enormous difference in ultimate capability that a Discovery owner would enjoy. If you want to further embellish that, an optional advanced tow assist system is designed to autonomously steer a hitched up trailer into place. All the driver has to do is operate the accelerator and brake pedals. So this car is capable. You'd want that if you were towing with it and you'd particularly expect it when the time comes to leave the tarmac. Now, to be honest, we'd approach this aspect of the Discovery 5's repertoire with some misgivings. After all, this car lacks its predecessor's 
tough, rough, integrated body frame, double chassis underpinnings, and the potential for the class-leadingly high maximum ride height that the old approach delivered. With the air suspension raised as high as it would go, the old Discovery 4 could sit as much as 310 millimeters from the ground. This car will ground out if obstacles beneath it are higher than 283 millimeters. Now, to give you some class perspective, uh, Savile Row suited Mercedes GLS can manage up to 306 millimeters. The approach angle of slopes you can tackle in this Discovery 5 uh, can't be quite as acute as it was before either. Now, none of this sounds like a recipe for creating the most capable Land Rover model ever made, including the Defender. But that is just what the Solely Hull brand claims is an offer this time around. Look a little closer, though, at what's been achieved here, and the reasons for that confidence start to become apparent. Let's start with some of the standard things that owners of the previous model will recognize. So first, the twin-speed gearbox that gives you a whole extra set of low-range ratios that you'll really need if the going gets sticky. And secondly, Land Rover's acclaimed terrain response system, which, in its most basic form, offers a choice of three selectable settings to suit the ground that you're covering. Uh, there's grass, gravel, snow, sand, or mud and ruts. Now, the Solihull engineers have built on this by giving this Mark V model discovery a superb 500 millimetres of wheel articulation and massive 900 millimetres of wading depth. Now, if you're fording a river and you want to test that second stat, it'll be useful to have the optional wade sensing feature fitted, and that's there to show you the depth of the water that you're driving through. A visual display and warning chimes will alert you as the water level rises around the vehicle. There's one extra piece of fresh 4x4 technology developed for this fifth generation model. Even more sophisticated features are included as part of the Extra Cost Capability Plus pack. And that's available across the range, though annoyingly not with entry level trim, and that's a spec that's most likely to be favoured by serious off roaders. Now, this pack includes three key items. Our favourite element is the Terrain Response 2 system, which, as the name suggests, is an upgraded version of that Terrain Response setup I mentioned earlier. Now, it works in the same way, but it adds an extra rock crawl setting and, more importantly, a really useful auto mode, which uh, analyses the conditions that you're driving in and then automatically selects the most suitable terrain program to cope. Really sticky surfaces will be made easier by an active rear locking differential. Plus, the pack also includes an all-terrain progress control system. That's essentially a, a kind of low-speed cruise control that helps you maintain steady progress on really challenging trails. All of this facilitates an approach angle of 34 degrees that'll get you up steep slopes. And once you've used the hill descent control to ease you down them again, you'll be glad of a useful departure angle of 30 degrees. Uh, the ramp angle is equally impressive, giving you 27.5 degrees. In short, be assured, this discovery is almost certainly uh, more talented off-road than you are. All that's really necessary is that you uh, acclimatise to its capabilities, press all the right buttons, and then just tune into Radio 4 and watch the worst that the elements can throw at you just glide past the window. Of course, the greatest challenge this car will face uh, in the hands of most likely owners will be that of the urban jungle. Now, the styling of this fifth generation model helps to hide some of its bulk, but it is still an enormous thing, uh, nearly five metres long and over two metres wide. So you'll have to pay close attention when you're heading up multi-storey ramps or driving through barriers. Mind you, a turning circle of 12.3 uh, metres is pretty good for a car of this stature. And we have found that reversing into bays is simpler than it is in, say, an Audi Q7 or a Mercedes GLS. Head out onto more open roads and you'll find that this discovery can turn in a far more convincing performance as a luxury saloon than any of its predecessors. Even with its tall sides, there's no hint of it being swayed offline by crosswinds. Instead, it feels planted and solid, so you can sit back and relax as the suspension soaks away the undulations. So, what do you think? 
No, it doesn't look like the kind of discovery you're probably used to seeing. It was never going to. Uh, the square, quite utilitarian looking previous generation designs in this model line hardly ever featured on the wish list of customers buying sleeker, if less capable, seven seat large SUVs like Audi's Q7 and Volvo's XC90. Going forward, Land Rover needed to change that. So chief designer Jerry McGovern and his styling team took a clean sheet approach and set out to do something different. Or quite different anyway. Uh, the front end is very much a development of the look that we're already familiar with from the smaller Discovery Sport model. Plus, there's a traditional Land Rover clamshell bonnet and the stepped roof line and the prominent rear C-pillar are both apparently inspired by discoveries of the past. Make of that what you will. What it all boils down to is the most fundamental change ever delivered to buyers in the three decades in which we've become familiar with this model line. Uh, sit this Mark V design alongside its predecessor and the two cars seem several generations apart, especially here at the front where the bluff, squarical visage of the Discovery 4 has made way for sculpted surfaces, jaw-like headlamps and a faster windscreen angle. These vertical corner bumper outlets give the shape some overtaking presence, while a prominent silvered skid plate lower down reminds the world at large of this Land Rover's SUV ancestry. Uh, here at the side, you get a proper perspective of the sheer size of this car. It's nearly five metres long and more than two metres wide, although that's not really any larger than a rival Volvo XC90, and the length is actually a touch shorter than an Audi Q7. Uh, as promised, this rear C-pillar certainly does stand out, although in our view it also delivers a hint of Sang Yong that the profile would have been better off without. Nicer is this side vent in the front wing that blends into a rising crease that runs the whole length of the car. This swage line lower down gives the flank some much needed shape and it separates black plastic clad wheel arches that house rims uh, between 19 and 22 inches in size. We've got the 21 inches here. Controversies with this fifth generation model's design continue at the rear. Now, we'll address the supposedly sacrilegious decision to dispense with the previous car's split rear tailgate later and confine ourselves here to wondering about the curious offset positioning of this number plate recess. That's apparently another nod to discoveries of the past, according to Land Rover. Uh, the now horizontally orientated rear lamps, they look good though, uh, particularly in this signature Highline guys that you get with the plusher trim. Below there's another prominent silvered skid plate, while above this carefully shaped uh, roof spoiler has been styled to minimise accumulating tailgate dirt. Of course, as usual, of much more importance are the things you can't see. Now, when the second generation Range Rover Sport was launched in 2012, it borrowed the Discovery Model Line's clever integrated body frame structure. Now, the Discovery returns the compliment, borrowing the Range Rover Sport's much lighter aluminium monocoque. Now, that is a major contributor to weight savings that can amount to as much as 480 kilos this time around. But it doesn't stop an optioned up TD6 model like this one still weighing in at around 2.3 tonnes. Time to take a seat inside. Now, you'd be disappointed if you didn't have to climb up into a discovery. That's all part of the appeal. Although older folk can ease the process by selecting the low-set access mode that's provided as part of the air suspension settings. And once you're installed in the driver's chair, you get a commanding view of the road ahead that locates your eye line several inches above where it would be in a German rival. In that respect, this car is similar to its Range Rover Sport showroom stablemate, but this cabin uh, quite intentionally lacks the purposeful driver positioning of that car and also some of the sheer indulgence of its fixtures and fittings. Now, that is not to say that it can't be very smart indeed. Certainly is in this top-trimmed variant with Windsor leather upholstery that is extended into the doors and onto a dashboard featuring polished oak veneer. Uh, the circular rising gear shift rotary dial is carried over from the previous model, but not much else is. And there's a clean, fresh, almost Scandinavian quality to the design, uh, delivering a premium feeling, very much able to equal what you get in obvious rivals. 
Finding a comfortable driving position could hardly be easier, especially if you have the 16-way uh, power adjustable chairs featured on upper spec models, seats that can include the heating, climate and massaging functions that pampered buyers in this segment now expect. The stats suggest that there's not quite as much room to stretch out as you get in a rival Q7 or XE90, but you'd have to be very lanky indeed to notice the difference. Uh, what is noticeable in comparison to those two rivals is the fact that the instrument binnacle contains old-fashioned dials rather than a configurable digital TFT screen of the kind that's now becoming commonplace in cars of this price. Uh, Jaguar Land Rover presumably wants that to be a differentiating feature for its pricier range. Range Rover models. Still, there's nothing wrong with the conventional cowled gauges that, as on smaller Land Rover models, are separated by a smart colour display that shows trip computer data and details the various driving settings you've selected. Less clear and intuitive are the buttons on the restyled four-spoke steering wheel that allow you to access the functionality of that screen. Um, you're going to need to spend some time with your nose buried in the instruction manual to figure out both these and also the new in-control infotainment system. And that's accessed uh, by a centre dash monitor that can be either 8 inches in size or, as here, provided in a more sophisticated 10-inch in-control pro form. Either way, you get a significant amount of the Solihull brand's latest media technology accessed either via voice control or a touchscreen with a uh, smartphone style pinch and swipe functionality. Um, unfortunately, what you don't get is the kind of lower rotary controller that makes comparable Audi and Volvo systems so easy to get to grips with. Still, once you do master the whole package, it's undeniably very impressive. Uh, it not only deals with the expected informational, telephone and navigational functions, but it also provides a high-quality DAB audio system and delivers a 4x4i display that shows you the state of play of everything from deactivating diff locks to driving into rivers. This screen also allows access into Land Rover's suite of in-control connected car technologies. A little disappointingly, these don't enable you to connect in your smartphone via Apple CarPlay or Android Auto, but they do allow almost every other imaginable kind of media connectivity you wish to be catered for. Uh, you can even sync your Apple Watch to the car if you've got one. Uh, specify the in-control setup correctly and you'll be able to Facebook your friends, you'll be able to catch up on the news and surf through many of your favourite apps. Uh, with the upgraded in-control Pro package fitted, your discovery will also be able to function as a Wi-Fi hotspot for up to eight devices. Plus, if required, the system will learn your daily commute, it will picture your destinations and it'll allow you to monitor and activate its functionality remotely via your smartphone. Plus, we're always impressed by Jaguar Land Rover's optional dual view technology, which enables this monitor to simultaneously display a different image to the driver and to the passenger. So at the wheel, uh, you can, say, view the navigation display while your passenger watches a video. Very neat. Now, let's get practical. Uh, there's been a 65% increase in the amount of stowage space provided for front seat passengers, and the cleverest touch in that regard is this one, a uh, little compartment that's hidden behind the ventilation controls, ideal for stashing valuables out of sight. Uh, you also get upper and lower glove boxes, and the deep door pockets get upper and lower sections too. In addition, there's this decently sized storage area at the bottom of the centre stack, plus there's twin cup holders in the centre to console and there's a small compartment by the driver's right knee too. Now if you don't specify the rear seat entertainment system we have here uh, then there's a sunglasses compartment that folds out of this roof panel and plusher HSE variants get a useful curry hook that presses out from a panel in the front passenger footwell. Uh, you'll also be regularly using this big lidded stowage box uh, between the seats uh, and this can be kitted out with a refrigerated lower section and it also features this uh, upper tray for coins and smartphone handsets that's conveniently located near the HDMI, uh, the twin USB, 12 volt and SIM ports. Right, let's move rearwards. Now, in many ways, the further back you go, the more spacious this discovery becomes by class standards. That's something that's immediately obvious once you pull back this wide opening door and take a seat in the second row. 
Uh, now, although this middle compartment can't quite match the roomy feel that you get in a rival Volvo XC90, there is 960 millimetres of legroom, so it's significantly more spacious than the longer Audi Q7 can manage to be. This low central transmission tunnel also makes it more viable for the transport of three fully grown adults who get their own ventilation controls and ports for almost every conceivable kind of media connectivity. Each seat can slide back and forth and you can recline the backrests too. And that adjustment is electrically powered, providing you choose one of the plusher HSE variants. This fifth generation model's change in shape has allowed this optional panoramic glass roof to be significantly bigger this time around. And the twin screens and the white fire headphones of this optional rear seat entertainment system provide another upmarket touch. Plus there are reasonably sized door bins, uh, there are seat back pockets and Isofix child seat fastenings on the two outer seats. So, Time to take a seat in the third row. Now, if you have the electrically powered rear seat package fitted, you might reasonably expect this outer second row chair to glide out of the way without any sort of huffing and puffing on your part. In actual fact, though, the electric assistance only applies to this seat backrest. Um, you're going to have to push the seat base forward yourself and tug it back again afterwards. And once you've moved that uh, middle seat out of the way, well, you would think that the small increase in length of this fifth generation model would make access to the very rear a little easier this time around. But as you can see, uh, it's still not that easy to get into these third row chairs. Now, dropping the air suspension down to that lower access mode I mentioned earlier will certainly help with a step up, but the wriggle required through the restricted gap may still be beyond grandma if you're thinking of confining her to the very back of this car on your next Sunday afternoon trip out to the garden centre. Once you are inside, it is clear that this is that rarest of things, a seven-seat car that isn't a five-seater with a couple of extra boot-mounted child seats, which is all that nearly every opposition model leaves you with. Now, we're thinking here of the rival XC90 and Q7 SUVs we mentioned earlier. And when they created this car, Land Rover's development department were too. Now, a member of that team is six foot four inches tall, and apparently he is quite comfortable in these seats. He was squashed and had his head shoved into the roof, though, when the brand tested those rival Volvo and Audi models. The main reason for that lies with the stepped roof line that we mentioned at the beginning of this section. And another thing that that design touch makes possible is the so-called stadium seating arrangement. Now, this sees uh, the rear chairs positioned higher than those at the front uh, and gives occupants a better view out and also reduces the possibility of travel sickness. Um, legroom, well, that's very reasonable by the mean standards of this class too, uh, provided middle seat folk have pushed their sliding seats forward a bit to help out. Uh, the 38mm increase in wheelbase length of this fifth generation model certainly helps here too. Uh, each of these chairs have Isofix child seat fastenings. Why do so many car makers forget that when it comes to third row seating? Plus, seat heating is optional. Um, in addition, both occupants are provided with their own vents, uh, they have cup holders, and they have individual storage areas that are fitted out with USB ports. Right, let's finish by taking a look in the boot. Now, at the time of the launch of this car, there was a lot of fuss made about Land Rover having dispensed with this model line's trademark split opening rear tailgate. And that was mainly voiced by people who had completely forgotten that the original first generation Discovery didn't feature one of those either. Fortunately, buyers of uh, this latest version aren't stuck with the awful heavy side hinge door that owners of that old car were stuck with, but instead they're given a plastic hatch featuring the power operation and optional foot gesture control that for us largely justifies the switch in design this time around. In theory, you even get to keep the previous split folding arrangements tailgate picnic style functionality thanks to this welcome electrically deployable seat panel. In practice, this rather meanly proportioned bench is a bit narrow for a picnic perch, but it is ideal if you want somewhere to sit when you're pulling on your Wellingtons. And apparently, it can take up to 300 kilos, which will be good news for portlier owners. 
Uh, when you push that back up, it helps to secure luggage in place. There won't be much of that, mind you, at least when the third row chairs are in place, in which configuration this Discovery offers 258 litres of cargo capacity, which is less than you get from comparable rivals when the seats are all up. Still, uh, there is a helpful uh, small underfloor compartment. There are pull-out sidewall bag hooks, and there is the brilliantly useful extra functionality of being able to drop the air suspension down at the back to more easily get heavy items in. If you have one of the HSE models with the electric rear seat folding package, your Discovery will have a mildly confusing looking switch panel like this one in the cargo bay sidewall. This incorporates a button for the air suspension lowering feature I just mentioned, as well as, in this case, one for the optional electrically extending tow bar. Otherwise, all the other buttons provided deal with seat retraction or erection. You don't have to use them, though. Uh, electric rear seat activation can also be operated via the center dash in control touch screen or for ultimate supermarket car park theatre an intelligent seat fold system that's standard on this top HSE luxury variant and optional on an HSE allows you to flatten or raise all the seats in just 14 seconds using an app on your smartphone. We'll stick with the switches here though and if you press the appropriate ones uh, to drop the two third row chairs into the floor a huge 1137 litres of carrying capacity will be freed up which is a class leading figure and a massive amount more than you get in a rival Audi Q7. Now, that should be more than enough for most needs, but if it isn't, you can also tip the middle chairs forward uh, to create a vast and pretty flat cargo area with more than two metres of load length and 2,406 litres of total capacity. That's the best part of 500 litres more than you get in a Q7 or an XC90. That's an enormous difference. Uh, securing hooks on the floor and power sockets in the side walls help you make the most of it. Expect to pay somewhere in the 45 to 70,000 pound bracket for your discovery. Uh, entry level S trim comes only with the base four cylinder SD4 diesel engine, but opt for SE, HSE, or HSE luxury spec, and you'll be offered the choice of all three of the available power plants. Most buyers opt to find the £1,300 premium necessary to progress from the SD4 variant to the TD6 six cylinder diesel derivative that we're trying here. Few will be tempted to go a step further and find the £2,000 necessary to uh, progress from the TD6 to the thirsty three litre. SI6 supercharged petrol model. As you probably expect, uh, every variant gets full-time four-wheel drive and an eight-speed automatic gearbox. Plus, with all discoveries, you get air suspension and a proper off-road orientated twin-speed low-range transfer box. And those are both things that you'd have to pay extra for on an entry-level Range Rover Sport. OK, so those are the basic things that you need to know about the lineup. But before we get into how those figures compare against equivalent SUVs from opposition brands, we ought to say a word or two about where this car sits in Land Rover's own product range. Now, the closest of the Solihull company's models in terms of price is probably the Range Rover Velar, but that is a slightly smaller five-seat only SUV, although many variants of it still cost significantly more than you'd have to find for a Discovery. Uh, another more familiar, slightly smaller Land Rover product is the Discovery Sport model that you'll find on the other side of one of the company's showrooms. Now, that car uh, is priced in the 30 to £50,000 bracket, and it does, like this one, give you seven seats, but uh, its third row pews are strictly for children rather than being properly adult orientated as they are here. The same is true of the optional third seating row you can add into an equivalent Range Rover Sport, which is generally seen to be more comparable to this discovery, at least in terms of overall size. Now, that product is priced from around £60,000 and it shares the same four-cylinder diesel and supercharged petrol engines as you'll find in a Discovery, plus, of course, most of the same mechanicals and electronics. Uh, think in terms of a premium of around thirteen to £15,000 to go from this Discovery to an equivalent Range Rover Sport and you'll be about right. Bear in mind, though, that the Range Rover product six-cylinder, three-litre diesel engine is the brand's more powerful 306 bhp SDV6 unit rather than the 258 bhp TD6 engine used here. And remember, too, that if you want seven seats in a Range Rover Sport, there's an extra £1,500 to find to get it fitted out with third-row capability. 
OK, so now let's take a look at how this discovery compares to similar products from opposition brands. Well, are there any? You could argue not. Uh, most of the large luxury SUV rivals you could name are, after all, either too utilitarian or they're not capable enough off-road or they lack seven-seat capability or they're too expensive. I mean, delete is appropriate. For the last three decades, there's been nothing else quite like a disco and in many ways there still isn't. Still, let's guide you through the potential alternatives. Now, the entry-level £44,000 Discovery S SD4 four-cylinder diesel model is clearly there to allow Land Rover to provide an alternative to up-spec versions of slightly smaller seven-seat SUVs. It is, after all, quite possible these days to pay 40000 or more for top versions of cars like Hyundai Santa Fe or Kia Sorento. Now, if you don't mind a more utilitarian, old-school feel with much higher running costs, then more credible and comparably sized alternatives to the base Discovery variant could be found in old stage of 4x4s like a top spec Mitsubishi Shogun or a base spec Toyota Land Cruiser, both of which would cost you a similar amount. The rest of the Discovery range, as we suggested earlier, is priced firmly in the 50 to £65,000 territory for large segment full size luxury SUVs. Now, none of the models in question can get anywhere near the Solihull product's capability off-road, and many of the models that will spring to mind, Mercedes GLE, Porsche's KN, uh, and Maserati's Levante, or, if you want to save a little, uh, Volkswagen's Touareg, Jeep's Grand Cherokee, or Lexus's RX, aren't really directly comparable as rivals because they can't be ordered with seven seats. BMW's equivalently priced X5 can be, but the chairs in question are very cramped. Two more relevant rivals can be found in the form of Volvo's XC90 and Audi's Q7, both of which can offer three properly sized seating rows and pricing roughly comparable to discovery levels. Both are good products, but they also both are slightly smaller in terms of interior space. Uh, they would struggle hugely in serious off-road conditions, and in both cases they can't get anywhere near the three and a half ton towing capability this Land Rover can offer. Discovery buyers also get a wider range of diesel engines um, the Volvo is only available with a four-cylinder unit, while the Audi comes only with a V6. There's a choice of both with this Solihull product. So, if having looked at all those options, you decide it is a discovery that you really want, you're certainly going to need some guidance in choosing the right specification and options for your car. So let's start by looking at what the various trim levels offer. Even base S-Spec will give you big 19-inch alloy wheels, a powered tailgate, a heated windscreen, a powered heated door mirrors, cruise control, a parametric alarm and Land Rover's acclaimed terrain response system, which offers a choice of selectable settings to suit the type of ground that you're travelling on. Inside, there's an 8-inch infotainment screen in the centre of the dash and that is your access point for Bluetooth phone connectivity and a six-speaker in-control touch DAB audio system. Plus, there's also a powered inner tailgate that retracts, so you've got somewhere to sit to uh, put on your wellies. And an in-control protect app also allows you to monitor your vehicle from your smartphone. Most Discovery buyers, though, start their little search from a mid-range SE trim, if only to get themselves the option of being able to specify the 3-litre TD6 six-cylinder diesel engine as the most popular unit in the range. With an SE spec model, you'll get most of the features that mark out a proper luxury SUV these days. So things like uh, full LED headlights, leather upholstery, satellite navigation and a really good audio package. In this case, a 10 speaker, 250 watt enhanced sound system in control touch setup. Plus, with a Discovery SE variant, you'll get front fog lamps, auto headlamps and wipers, power folding mirrors, front and rear parking sensors, heated, electrically adjustable front seats, uh, ambient interior lighting, an auto-dimming rear view mirror and two-zone climate control. Next up is HSE spec, a trim level that Landover reckons will be the most popular one for customers. Now it's from this point in the range that the Discovery comes as standard with two of its most significant features, powered operation for the rear seating rows and a larger, more sophisticated 10-inch centre dash touchscreen. Now from here you access uh, a higher tech in control touch pro navigation setup, a rear view camera and a 300 watt 10 speaker Meridian sound system with a subwoofer.
Uh, other HSE features include larger 20-inch alloy wheels, keyless entry, heated rear seats, uh, upgraded Windsor leather upholstery, a fixed panoramic sunroof, signature Highline tail lamp clusters and gesture control to open the tailgate simply by waving your foot beneath the bumper. And finally, if nothing but the most opulent discovery will do, you'll want an HSE luxury variant like the one we're trying here. Now, in this case, the alloy rims are huge, 21 inches, and quite a few of the existing equipment items are upgraded. Uh, the front seats, for example, gain lovely winged headrests, climate control and a massaging function. Uh, the leather trim is extended around the dash and the doors. The ambient lighting becomes configurable. Uh, the glass roof gains an opening front section. And the Meridian sound system becomes an even more powerful digital setup with 14 speakers and an 825-watt output. Plus, back seat folk will be better looked after, courtesy of four-zone climate control and a rear seat entertainment system with two 8-inch screens and white fire wireless headphones. Other HSE luxury features include a surround camera setup, a heated steering wheel, uh, premium carpet mats and an intelligent seat fold system, which makes it possible to drop the rear chairs via a smartphone app when you want to make full use of the Discovery's huge load capacity. On to extra cost options. Now, most of the HSE luxury features I just mentioned can be added into a lesser HSE model at extra cost. And some items can be fitted in variants further down the lineup too. Although, as usual, you'll be more limited in the additions you can make to lesser derivatives. Before ticking the boxes for particular items, though, first have a look at the various optional packs your dealer will want to tell you about, which bundle together key items more cost effectively. Uh, the various climate and technology packs are particularly worth looking at and there is a vision assist pack too which includes adaptive LED headlights amongst other things. Uh, there is one individual extra available across the range that we think all owners will want to look at that's the activity key. And it's a useful thing to have because you can wear it like a watch yet open and lock the car just by presenting it to the tailgate and that'll make easier the kind of outdoor pursuit rough road lifestyle this car was designed for and if you exercise that potential to the full there's another key option we think you're really going to want now this is the extra cost capability plus pack and it's available across the range providing you avoid entry level trim this includes three key features really sticky conditions will be made easier by an active rear locking differential and an all-terrain progress control system the latter essentially a kind of low speed cruise control that helps you maintain steady progress plus there's the terrain response 2 package which as its name suggests is an upgraded version of the terrain response setup I mentioned earlier and it works in the same way but it adds in an extra rock crawl setting and more importantly a really useful auto mode which analyzes the conditions you're driving in and then automatically selects the most suitable terrain program to cope. Now, if you are going to engage in that kind of driving, then a couple of other extras will also help. On upper spec models, you can add in a clever wade sensing feature that provides depth information when you're driving through water. And we'd also ideally want the surround view camera system we've been trying here. It's a setup which uses five digital cameras, providing an almost complete 360 degree view of the outside of the car. Now, if you've got that and you've also added in the Capability Plus pack and the electrically deployable tow bar that many owners want, then you'll also get the chance to specify Land Rover's advanced tow assist system. And that'll be a massive help when you're hitched up and you're trying to park a trailer. Now, with this setup, images from a rear-facing camera are relayed to the central touchscreen and the driver can manoeuvre using the Terrain Response 2 system's rotary controller. Uh, the advanced tow assist system will then autonomously steer the trailer into place. All the driver has to do is operate the accelerator and brake pedals. That is the essential stuff, but of course there's plenty else you can add to make your discovery easier to use, more luxurious, better looking and more practical. We'll go through a few of the key items for you. This car, for example, has a park assist system to steer you into spaces, which work really well with the optional rear view camera. And this particular discovery also features a head up display that projects key driving information onto the base of the windscreen so you can better keep your eyes on the road. 
It also has privacy glass, a front centre console cooler, climate control for the second row seats and a timed climate setup that can be set to warm or cool the cabin prior to your arrival. A TV receiver for the centre dash monitor has also been fitted here and to make the most of this we'd additionally want the brand's clever dual view touchscreen. Now this allows the display to show different things simultaneously so for example the front seat passenger can watch TV or a DVD while the driver views a sat nav. As for aesthetics, well, if you don't want the single standard solid paint colour, Fuji White, you'll have to pay extra for one of the metallic and premium metallic paint finishes. We've got premium metallic silicon silver here. There's a wide range of alloy wheel styles with rims varying in size from 19 to 22 inches. These optional 21 inch diamond turned rims are particularly nice. Uh, the bigger 21 and 22 inch wheels can come incorporated into the optional complete dynamic design pack or the alternative a dynamic exterior design pack, both of which add a range of exterior and interior trimming touches and give you the chance to have a contrast coloured roof finished in either black or grey. Alternatively, if you want an even meaner look, a further black design pack provides gloss black finishing for the wheels, the front grille, uh, the fender vents and the door mirror caps. Or you can add in your own individual exterior touches, things like chromed mirror covers, bright or black finished side vents, uh, body side mouldings and even, if you really must, bright side tubes. As for the inside, you can add in aluminium, oak or titanium mesh interior finishing to further smarten the cabin. Plus, there's a choice of luxury headliners, luxury carpet mats and a sports pedal kit. Three or four zone climate control systems are also available. On to more practical extra cost features. First and foremost here, we would want a proper full-size spare wheel to replace the reduced section spare that can come as standard. Bear in mind too that on most models, you'll have to pay extra for the brand's much trumpeted intelligent seat fold system that enables you to fold the rear seats using a smartphone app. Plus, you can specify heating for the third row seats, an extra 12 volt charging point for second row passengers and a cooler warmer box that fits into the rear seat armrest. Some owners might also want to add in things like an infrared reflective windscreen, a useful wireless phone charging cup holder and the in-control secure vehicle tracking system that provides stolen vehicle monitoring. Other optional practicalities are more predictable. Uh, the usual side steps and mud flaps, plus the black or silver roof rails and crossbars that together would enable you to carry uh, things like skis, snowboards, kayaks or roof box. Uh, a stainless steel body undershield will protect against off-road scrapes. And if you have a tow bar fitted, you'll also be able to specify a cycle carry that can take up to four bikes. A rubber mat, a luggage divider, a collapsible luggage carrier and a load space liner tray for the cargo area will also be useful as would a rigid organiser system for the load space, along with side and partition netting. On to safety, and we'll start with the standard features. Land Rover's got with the programme and added autonomous emergency braking into all Discovery models. Now, this is one of those setups that scans the road ahead, looking for potential accident hazards as you drive. Uh, if one's detected, then you'll be warned. If you don't respond, or you perhaps you aren't able to, the brakes will automatically be applied to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. Lane departure warning also comes as standard, as does an in-control protect feature in the infotainment system uh, that will automatically alert the emergency services as to your exact location should the airbags ever go off. Other standard safety features may be more familiar to you. Uh, we're impressed that Isofix child seat fastenings are fitted in the third row as well as in the second row. Although it is annoying that on an entry level S model, you have to pay extra for an Isofix attachment in the front passenger seat. Other standard safety items include a pedestrian friendly bonnet, uh, tire pressure monitoring, brake lights that flash in an emergency stop, and a whole bouncy castle cloture of airbags. More specifically, as well as airbags for both front seat occupants, you get side curtain and thorax airbags and an extended curtain airbag that covers passengers right back into the third row seating. Now, hopefully you'll never need any of this, but to try and ensure that the worst never happens, there's a whole raft of electronic assistance features. 
on road as well as the usual anti-lock brakes with EBA, emergency brake assist. These include DSC, dynamic stability control, ETC, electronic traction control, uh, RSC, roll stability control, and if you need it, TSA, trailer stability assist. Off-road, you're more likely to use HAS, Hill Start Assist, to get you up steep slopes, GAC, Gradient Acceleration Control, to ease you over the summit, and HDC, Hill Descent Control, to help you down the other side. Want to go further? Well, of course, that's certainly possible if you have more to spend. Uh, the Hiatech in-control touch pro navigation setup uh, that comes with top HSE and HSE luxury variants includes the traffic sign recognition and intelligent speed limiter system that pictures road signs as you pass them and then displays them on the centre dash screen and uh, which can be set to regulate your speed so you don't stray over the limit. Uh, these two top derivatives also come with three extra key safety features, all of which can be added into the mid-range SE model as part of an optional drive pack. Now, first up is a driver condition monitor. Now, this checks out your responses as you drive and flashes up warnings to stop if it detects drowsiness. There's also a blind spot monitor, and that works on the move to stop you from dangerously pulling out to overtake in front of another vehicle. And finally, uh, reverse traffic detection, which warns you of approaching vehicles if you're reversing out of a space. Alternatively, there's a Drive Pro pack that includes all three of those things, plus two further camera-driven extra items. Uh, lane Keep Assist works if you deviate over lane markings to subtly steer the car back to where it should be. More useful, though, is the Adaptive Cruise Control with Q Assist system. Now here, a radar mounted in the front grille maintains a steady distance to the car in front at cruising speeds and can break your discovery and then automatically start it off again if you come across a traffic we're tempted to start this section by saying that it's impossible to get around the fact that this is a very heavy car but that's patently untrue because Land Rover has tried very hard to get around that issue and it would be churlish for us not to recognize the extent of their efforts now, in this regard, uh, your dealer will talk about the benefits of the aluminium monocoque that's been borrowed from the Mark II model Range Rover Sport and also the headline 480 kilo weight reduction that's been conferred on this fifth generation Discovery as a result. Now, we're also enthusiastic about this change, but we would point out that 15% uh, of that monocoque is actually still mainly made up from steel and that the near half ton weight reduction claim is based on setting a three litre six cylinder Discovery 4 alongside a two litre four cylinder version of this fifth generation model, which doesn't seem to us to be a very accurate comparison. Suffice it to say that with the 3-litre TD6 six-cylinder diesel version of this car that most customers will buy, that's the one we're trying here, uh, the weight saving certainly isn't anything like 480 kilos. Nevertheless, it is substantial, which is why the figures of this variant, when we tested it back in uh, 2014 in Discovery 4 form, 35.3 mpg on the combined cycle and 213 grams per kilometre of CO2, are so much better in this equivalent Mark 5 3 litre TD6 model, uh, 39.2 mpg and 189 grams per kilometre. Which is pretty good for an SUV that in fully specced up guys like this will weigh the best part of 2.3 tonnes. Uh, you're still looking at a showing, though, that we'll see a Discovery TD6 travelling nine fewer miles on every gallon and putting out about 30 grams per kilometre more CO2 than a directly comparable volume version of Audi's Q7, the 3 litre TDI 272 PS model. And your company accountant will certainly notice that. With a comparable Volvo XC90, the difference would be even greater, as you perhaps expect it would be, because uh, that car uses a smaller four-cylinder diesel engine. As we've said, uh, this fifth generation Discovery can now offer a four-cylinder diesel too, the 240 PS uh, SD4 Ingenium power plant that's used in top versions of the smaller Discovery Sport. The difference that this more compact unit makes isn't massive though. Uh, expect a Discovery SD4 to return 43.5 mpg on the combined cycle and 171 grams per kilometre of CO2. 
Both of the diesel models should give you a realistic operating range of around 600 miles between Phillips. Uh, the parity is partly brought about by the fact that the TD6 variant has a bigger fuel tank to make up for its slightly greater thirst, 85 litres rather than 77 litres in size. At the opposite extreme in the range, the sole petrol model, the 3-litre SI6 supercharged V6 variant, manages only 26 miles per gallon and 254 grams per kilometre, again well down on what you get from a comparable rival. But then, across the range, the figures were always going to be. Rival large SUVs simply aren't built with the kind of inner strength that features here. And of course, they don't carry around heavy 4x4 engineering items like this car's twin-speed low-range transfer box. Aside from the structural and engineering changes that have taken place this time around, a number of other measures have been introduced to try to keep this car's efficiency showing within reasonable bounds. Uh, a 15% improvement in aerodynamic sleekness this time around obviously helps. Uh, the improvement is down not only to the curvier bodywork, but also to the addition of a front air curtain that allows the wind to pass into the front wheel arches to give a better flow over and around the car. Plus, at higher speeds, the electronically controlled air suspension automatically lowers the body by 13 millimetres to create less resistance. As you'd expect, there's also a stop-start system to cut the engine when you're waiting at the lights or sitting in a queue. Uh, the EU6 units on offer in the lineup use variable exhaust valve timing and selective catalytic reduction for extra cleanliness. And as with most modern diesels, there's an AdBlue after-treatment system that sprays an aqueous urea solution into the exhaust system, uh, neutralising harmful gases like nitrogen oxide. You can top up this solution's tank yourself or any Land Rover dealer will fill it for you when required every uh, 9,000 miles or so. Of course, the driver will need to play his or her part in pursuit of cleanliness and frugality, uh, keeping an eye on the eco data part of the infotainment screen. Now here you get various screen options. Uh, there's one that shows you the impact on fuel of various electrical items, and another with so-called eco tips that are supposed to improve your frugality. Although some of these, to be frank, are a bit blindingly obvious. Uh, there are things like make smooth use of the accelerator and maintain a constant speed. Most useful, though, is the driving style display that marks your driving efficiency from one to five in three areas, uh, acceleration, speed and engine, and braking. It also helps that the routing software for the in-control touch pro navigation system can propose an economical route option to minimize fuel consumption. What else? Um, insurance. Well, the ratings here depend quite a lot on the trim level you select. With the four-cylinder SD4 diesel variant, you're looking at a rating of Group 33E for the base S version, rising to Group 37E for a SE, a 3080 for the HSE, and 40E for the HSE luxury derivative. If you go for this 3-litre TD6 model, the ratings start at Group 40E for an SE, rise to 41E for an HSE, and 42E for this HSE luxury variant. For the 3-litre SI6 petrol discovery, uh, with those three trim levels, the ratings are 41E, 42E and 43E respectively. As for depreciation, well, you'll be expecting that to be significant. It always is with any large luxury SUV. Uh, those models in greatest demand uh, shed, of course, less of their value. And this discovery remains in great demand on the used market. Hence, strong retained values, which for mainstream models vary between 568 and 58.7% uh, of the original purchase price after a typical three-year ownership period. As a result, leasing rates for this car aren't as high as the list figure asking prices might lead you to believe. Even the green lobby feels more kindly towards this model these days, and that wasn't always true. After all, in 2005, Greenpeace activists chained themselves to vehicles on the solely held production line in protest. They shouldn't bother to do that now. Such have been the eco efforts made with this Mark V design. Up to 50% of the aluminium that much of it is fashioned from is sourced from recycled content. And that's a really useful stat to have if you come across disapproving green bearded folk. Now, you might also mention that in a decade or so's time, when comparable German SUVs are being driven to the recycling plant, this discovery will almost certainly still be going strong. A three-year unlimited mileage warranty comes with this model, along with three years of roadside recovery, uh, plus there are further extension packages available if you want them. 
Um, in addition, there is an in-control protect service that allows you to monitor vital stats on your car from your smartphone, and it will also guide the breakdown services to your discovery should it ever have a problem. Also included is European cover and a promise to get you on your way as soon as possible in your own car or in a loan car if the required repair will take longer than four hours. As for maintenance, well, your costs here will be at a different level from what you'd pay to look after a similarly priced luxury saloon. Now, particularly when it comes to um, tyres and brakes, so budget accordingly. Having said that, though, the Discovery should cost less to maintain than a comparable Audi Q7 or Volvo XC90. Routine servicing appointments can be up to 21,000 miles apart, although that figure could vary depending on how you use your car. If you want to budget ahead for garage visits, uh, an optional advanced service plan pack will cover all maintenance for five years or 50,000 miles. Um, and that's for a price no more than the cost of a single full service on a rival Audi Q7. And that's worth knowing. The world takes on a different appearance from behind the wheel of a Land Rover Discovery. It always did and it still does. At the helm, you know you're in a car that can take on just about anything, be that a seven-up trip to the Alps or a relaxing ride home on a wet and slippery winter's night. But it's only when you put it through its paces in properly extreme terrain that the genius in its design becomes fully apparent. How can a car capable of such extremes on the rough stuff be so utterly easy to use on the school run? Only Land Rover knows. Of course, German branded SUV rivals are sportier, but then the Solihull brand has the Range Rover Sport to take them on for those that can afford it. Those who can't and who want to buy a British need a discovery that can stay in the same dynamic ballpark as, say, an Audi Q7 or a Volvo XC90, at the same time as continuing to obliterate cars like that off-road. They want a discovery that uh, isn't vastly more expensive to run than more compromised competitors, and one that can be ordered with all the high-tech gadgetry that those rivals offer. This, Land Rover says, is that car, and in many ways, they're right. There's certainly uh, a lot to admire about the way the brand has so successfully reinterpreted the discovery concept for a new and more challenging era. Although we do worry that as part of that process, this may have become more of a Range Rover product with uh, slightly more practical packaging. There are a few other concerns too. Like most reviewers, and we suspect many potential buyers, we think the rear styling looks awkward. Some of these people bemoan the passing of the previous model split rear tailgate too, although that is a matter of preference. Perhaps a bigger problem though is that this car still has a weight issue. It has been helpful that Land Rover has adopted aluminium intensive architecture and offered buyers the option of a force and a diesel unit to try and alleviate the effect of all this. But the simple truth is that this Discovery's efficiency figures, although much better than before, still lag behind those of obvious rivals. But then that is an almost inevitable byproduct of creating such a capable SUV. One that has so much sheer depth to its ability that at the wheel you constantly find yourself being tempted to test it, to enjoy what it can do. Pothole tracks no longer need to be taken at a snail's pace. Uh, the softest roadside verges become viable turning opportunities and any muddy bank cries out to be driven up and down again just for the heck of it. Other rival SUVs claim to be tough, but at the wheel, you're always a little hesitant to see them prove that. Discovery's different, thanks to a clever, classless feel that nothing else can quite replicate. It brings a wonderful authenticity to its market segment. Enough to make it the world's ultimate family SUV? Well, that depends on your perspective. Those who come to this segment in search of the genuine article will surely think so. One thing for certain, though, there's nothing else quite like it.